Graphic Warning. The following stories are based on true events. Please take into consideration the severe nature of these crimes and the horrific repercussions that the victims' families were forced to live with after. And be respectful when researching and sharing the subsequent reports. We all enjoy fictional horror stories and can even appreciate the genuine accounts of terrifying true events with a grim fascination because we observe them all from a distance knowing that we'll be safe. Keep in mind that not everyone is so lucky and sometimes real life can be just as terrifying as fiction, if not more so. Our most sincere condolences go out to the victims and their families. And without further ado, let's begin. Number 1 For privacy reasons, I wish to keep my identity anonymous but I will recount to the best of my ability the events that unfolded back in the early 90s when I was a rookie and was assigned to ride along with one of the officers of the Gainesville Police Department. It was on a Sunday around 4 p.m. in August of 1990 when 35-year-old officer Ray Barber was about to sign off at the end of his shift. He got a call from the communications officer on his car radio. It was a Signal 64, a call to assist a citizen. I had met Ray, he was a good cop, dedicated to the job, and more than capable of handling the occasional curveball. When he drove into the courtyard at the Williamsburg Village Apartments, the maintenance man was there to meet him. As Barbara got out of his car, the man told him that he had a couple of anxious parents warning him to open their daughter's apartment, as they could not get her to answer the door. Unwilling to take responsibility himself, he called the police. Barbara was initially unconcerned as he received dozens of calls about supposedly missing kids, who usually turned up unharmed with no idea of the anxiety they had caused. It was only when the parents told him that their daughter, Christina, only 17 years old, had known that they were driving from Jacksonville that morning and had not been seen by anyone since early on Friday, although her car was still parked nearby, that Officer Barber began to feel uneasy. This feeling increased when he was informed that Christina's roommate, Sonja Larson, also 17, had not called her mother the day before as arranged. Barbara had the parents and the landlord wait outside as he entered the apartment alone, and what he found surpassed his worst expectations, and all he could do was frantically put out a call to the paramedics and have additional officers sent out immediately to help secure the scene. The blood-soaked remains of the two women before him was possibly the worst mutilation he had ever seen, and the closest he had ever come to being inside a living nightmare, and he had no idea what he was going to tell the anxious parents waiting just outside. Both girls had been bound, stripped, and furiously stabbed to death. It was also later confirmed that they had been sexually assaulted, one of which was post-mortem. It was the first week of the fall semester, they hadn't even unpacked all their boxes yet. Within minutes, backup had arrived, myself along with them. There was as many as 20 law enforcement personnel, including the chief of police, Waylon Clifton. Following closely on their heels was the media. Lieutenant Sadie Darnell was appointed to be the media spokesperson. All she could tell them was that two young women had been murdered after someone apparently forced their way through the door. Sometime between 11.30 p.m. August 23rd and 4 p.m. August 26th, word of the murders had spread through the Williamsburg Village Apartments. Although the police had not publicly released their names, the crowds that gathered were soon whispering that the girls were freshmen, one of them from Palm Beach and the other from Jacksonville. One neighbor recalled to my partner and I that he heard someone showering and playing loud music early on Friday morning. Then there was a loud banging sound. He assumed that the girls had been hanging pictures on the wall. As I spoke with another officer over the radio, I watched as a young woman walked from her car toward the building where the two victims had been found. She had been out of town over the weekend and had heard nothing of the day's events. When she approached the door to her building, a uniformed officer on duty asked her her name. When she told him it was Elsa Strepp, she was escorted from the scene and taken to the Alachua County Crisis Center. Once inside, she was told that her roommates, Christina Powell and Sanja Larson, had been murdered. She almost collapsed from the shock, 
It was some time before it struck her, just how closely she had come to meeting the same fate as her two friends. I left the scene shortly after the coroners arrived, but the police continued to work into the night, questioning other residents, checking for fingerprints and other clues, and further details of the crimes began to circulate, such as one of the girls being mutilated somehow, something to do with her breasts. I never saw the bodies up close, so I couldn't say for sure. Regardless, the fear and panic began to spread as the story traveled beyond the apartment block to the rest of the community. Before the police had even finished packing up and sealing the area, they were called to a second site, where they were awaited by deputies Keith O'Hara and Gail Barber from the Alachua County Sheriff's Office. My patrol car was rerouted there as well. Officer Gail Barber had spent the earlier part of the evening with her husband, Ray Barber. After he had made the gruesome discovery of Christina and Sanja's bodies, she wanted to stay with him longer, but she was on the roster for the midnight shift. She hadn't been on long before dispatch had called to ask them to drop by Krista Lee Hoyt's apartment, just in case. 18-year-old Krista worked the midnight shift as a records clerk at the Alachua County Sheriff's Office. She hadn't arrived for work and wasn't answering her phone. It was 12.30 a.m. Gail knew Krista well and was sure that there would be some logical explanation as for why she hadn't called in. When O'Hara and Barber knocked on Krista's front door, there was no answer. They were almost relieved. They reassured themselves that she had probably left for work already. Then they saw her car, an older model Nissan Sentra, parked nearby. They knocked again, and then tried the door, which was locked. Hearing the noise, manager Elbert Hoover came out to investigate. The three of them went to the back of the apartment. Hoover knew something was wrong the moment he saw the gate had been damaged, and the chain link fence was down. As O'Hara and Barbara went further into the backyard, they told Hoover to wait around the front for them. Once they established that there was no one in the backyard, they tried the glass sliding door, which was locked from the inside. They noticed that the bamboo shades over the door did not reach the floor. They bent down on their hands and knees to peer under the curtain. Through the beam of the flashlight, they could see what appeared to be a naked body seated on the edge of the bed. It was bent over at the waist, with a small pool of blood at the feet, which were still clad in shoes and socks. They came to the shocking realization that the body didn't have a head. The two officers ran back to their patrol car to notify the station. It was 1 a.m. Moments later, the first of the investigating team had arrived. Officers Barber and O'Hara quickly briefed Sergeant Baxter and Lieutenant Nobles, telling them that they heard water running in the apartment. There was a strong possibility that the killer was still inside. O'Hara and Barber were told to take up positions around the outside of the apartment. While Baxter and Nobles waited for more backup to arrive, it was half an hour before they were ready to enter the building. When I arrived and positioned myself on the perimeter, I could barely grasp the severity of the situation. Two major crime scenes in one shift. I watched tentatively as the police prepared to breach, and I prayed they would find the suspect inside. When they entered through the front door, they moved slowly, ready for anything. The bathroom was first. They could hear dripping water from the shower, but there was no one there, though there were bloodstains on the floor. When they left the bathroom, they saw Krista's lifeless head facing them, propped up on a bookshelf in the bedroom. The headless corpse of the once beautiful Krista was sitting at the end of the bed. Barely able to breathe, they checked under the bed and in the closets. Confident that the killer was long gone, the two officers made their way back outside. As they walked into the courtyard, they saw that the Gainesville police chief had arrived from the Williamsburg Village Apartments, along with many of the other officers. Although they had no jurisdiction in this area, they needed to know for sure if the murders were linked in any way. With the preliminary examination completed, it was time for the body to be moved. Alachua County's chief investigator gave the order. He later told the press that nothing could have prepared him for what he saw next. Apart from the decapitation, she had been carefully sliced from the breastbone to the pubic bone. I went home that night feeling like I had literally endured a baptism of blood, feeling overwhelmed and useless. I was also terrified that this madman would strike again the moment we dared to hope it was over. It was soon clear that the three murders were linked. At both scenes, 
the underwear was missing. A knife with a 4-6 to six inch blade had been used on all three girls, and the use of adhesive tape for restraint was evident, although it had been removed. At both scenes, there were also body parts missing. The viciousness of the crimes and the idea of a knife-wielding psychopath lurking among the citizens only added to their fear. Krista's murder meant that the killer may have not known his victims, and that they were chosen opportunistically. They didn't even attend the same school. Christina and Sonja were freshmen at the University of Florida, while Krista was a sophomore at Santa Fe Community College. That meant anyone could be next. On Monday night, the first press conference was held. Police attempted to reassure the public and put to rest some of the more frightening rumors that had begun to circulate. But due to the necessity of keeping many of the crime scene details under wraps, there was very little they could say to reassure the frightened community. The fact was that three young women had been brutally murdered inside their apartments, most likely by the same killer, who was still out there, somewhere. There was little that could be said to make the situation less frightening. The panic and fear reached its zenith the next day, Tuesday, August 28th, when two more bodies were found. This time, one of them was male. The victims were Tracy Inez Poles and Manuel Taboda, both 23 years old. Manuel had been a 6 foot 3 inch athlete, weighing over 200 pounds. There were no mutilations this time. Perhaps the killer had been interrupted before he could complete his sadistic plans. Tracy was found with a towel placed under her hips. From the wounds on his arms, the police concluded that he had put up quite a struggle before his death. With the discovery of the fourth and fifth bodies, Gainesville came under the spotlight of the national media. Soon comparisons were being made. One report highlighted the similarity between the Gainesville killings and the world's most infamous serial killer, Jack the Ripper. Stories about the Gainesville Ripper quickly became the media's latest draw card, guaranteeing soaring ratings. The police were soon swamped by calls. Thousands of possible suspects were identified. Ex-boyfriends and husbands were named as strong candidates. Anyone who had behaved strangely was likely to be reported. All of them had to be checked and cross-checked for any possible links to the killings. One name seemed to be coming up again and again. Daniel Harold Rowling. Rowling was a drifter and a known felon with a criminal history involving assault and burglary. He had been with someone named Tony Danzi near the woods where Krista Hoyt had been murdered. Rowling had made a campsite on the afternoon of the first murders. He had been on the way back to the campsite with Danzi, a new friend who supplied him with drugs. When the police noticed him, Danzi stopped to wait for the police, but Rowling ran. As two officers pursued Rowling, they came upon his campsite. Here they found a number of items which would later link Rowling to the five murders. As Rowling backed out of the parking area, the police were in pursuit, and a high-speed chase began. When Rowling crashed his car, he fled on foot to a nearby office. But as he left through the rear door, the police were waiting for him. He made one last attempt to escape their clutches, but it ended in failure, and he was arrested. I was on duty when he was brought into the station and was taken aback by how unremarkable he seemed. How could someone capable of such violence just blend into a crowd as easily as he did? Three days after Rowling's arrest on September 11th, 1990, the Gainesville Ripper story was dropped from the front page for the first time. The community of Gainesville, no longer under threat, wanted to forget the horror of that gruesome week of murder. Throughout the time prior to his trial, Rowling had trouble keeping his mouth shut and many inmates made contact with the investigation team to relate stories of Rowling's confessions. He formed a friendship with inmate Bobby Lewis, known as the only man to have escaped from Florida's death row. Rowling knew that escape was the only way he could ever get out of prison, and knew that Lewis could prove a helpful friend. In time, Rowling told Lewis all about the murders in explicit detail. He had admitted that he decided to kill while he was in prison during the 80s, long before he came to Gainesville. His escape was never carried out. And on July 31st, 1993, Rowling informed the Gainesville investigators that he wished to confess, through Bobby Lewis. During the three-hour confession, Rowling did not answer any of the investigators' questions directly, 
but confirmed the answers given by Lewis on his behalf. Through Lewis, Rowling effectively confessed to planning and committing five murders in Gainesville. He also told him that he had originally planned to kill eight people while in prison, and said that he would clear up the Shreveport homicides after the Gainesville murder trial. Rowling was also believed to be guilty of three slayings in his hometown, Shreveport, Louisiana, in 1989. Three family members were found stabbed to death in their home, almost a year before Rowling's deadly Gainesville crime spree. Similarities between the Louisiana case and the Florida murders helped lead investigators to Rowling, who had been in Shreveport and the Gainesville area when the crimes in both locations were committed. But this was ultimately never tied to the Shreveport crimes. He had attributed his behavior to abuse by his father, a police officer, and to an evil alter ego. Rowling later said in one of his confessions that he wanted to become a superstar. His tools were simple. His K-bar knife, duct tape, a handgun, and a screwdriver for break-ins. For his first double homicide in Gainesville, he didn't even need the screwdriver or gun when he saw the door was unlocked at the Williamsburg Village Apartments. In prison, he drew disturbing pictures and wrote a graphic book, The Making of a Serial Killer, with a woman who was his fiancée for a time. For his last meal, he asked for a lobster tail, butterfly shrimp, a baked potato, strawberry cheesecake, and sweet tea. On October 25, 2006, as relatives of the murder victims watched in the death chamber, Rowling was restrained in a gurney and turned his head briefly to gaze with pale blue eyes at the mother of one of the five victims for three minutes as a lethal injection was about to pump into him. Rowling chanted the refrain, None greater than thee, O Lord, none greater than thee. In only one respect did Rowling's death mirror that of his victims. He was bound and helpless, but unlike his victims, Rowling wasn't attacked by ambush while he slept. His victims were stabbed so hard that their chipped and slashed bones were later shown to the jury. After Rowling was pronounced dead, the staff at Florida State Prison wheeled his body out. In contrast, Rowling posed his mutilated victims in sexually provocative positions and kept body parts as trophies. I wasn't there when he was executed, but I remember hearing about it. I can't speak for the families, but for me, it provided no sense of closure. By that time, I had been on the job for several years, and I can tell you, most days you don't go home feeling like things are open and shut. For me, it was always more. Try to stop the bleeding enough to make a difference, but obviously some wounds just don't heal. Diana Hoyt, the stepmother of Krista Hoyt, later commented, I'm a nurse, and I've seen my patients die, and they had a much more horrific death than what this man suffered through. He was relaxed, went to sleep, and did not feel anything. Today's been a very surreal day for me. It's like a dream. Walking through a dream. Number 2 Apologies for any grammar mistakes. English is not my first language. Back in the early 2000s, I was working as a truck driver in Mexico City. I don't recall what I was transporting that evening. But it was late at night, and my mind was unfocused, and I was cruising a residential street, looking for a place to pull over so I could use the bathroom. As I cruised slowly through an intersection without braking, I noticed an individual jaywalking across the street from the glow of my headlights. I pressed down my brakes and honked, shouting in anger out the window at the person. I couldn't tell if the figure was a man or a woman at first, but when they turned around to yell back at me, I was pretty certain that it was a man in woman's clothing. He barked at me for several minutes in a deep, heavy voice and continued off down the sidewalk. In addition to the woman's clothing, I noticed the man was carrying a purse over one shoulder and a bulging plastic bag in his opposite hand. I shrugged and assumed that he was a male prostitute or something of the sort and continued up the road and forgot all about him a few minutes later. The whole incident lasted perhaps 15 seconds the next day, I heard through my wife's brother that an old woman named Anna Maria Alfaro had been murdered in her home the night before. On the exact same block, I had encountered the man in woman's clothing. I called the hotline and spoke to a female detective about my exchange with the stranger on the road 
and she seemed very interested, and asked me several additional questions about the person that I hadn't even had time to notice or consider. She then asked me if I would come in and sit down with a sketch artist, but I responded that I barely got a good look at the person's face, and mostly was just able to describe the person's build and voice. I never heard back from the detective, but what followed for several more years was a reign of murder and terror, where several elderly women were murdered in their homes. I remembered I was at my son's birthday party in January of 2006, when I heard the news that the old lady killer had been arrested, and while the person I had seen had very likely been the killer, he wasn't a male prostitute. In fact, it wasn't even a he. Juana Barraza was a 50-year-old woman and a professional Mexican wrestler, best known for her bright pink outfit with a butterfly mask. She was detained by police fleeing the scene of her latest murder after neighbors had reported sounds of a struggle. Motivated by the resentment of her mother, who let strange men sexually abuse her as a girl, Barraza murdered more than 11 elderly women in their own homes, often strangling them with phone cords or stethoscopes. After killing them, she would rob their houses and simply walk out the front door and into the night. Barraza had a very masculine face, and due to the testimony of several eyewitnesses, including my own, the police were convinced they were looking for a man dressed as a woman, likely a transvestite, and many long months were wasted questioning the transvestite community. Barraza selected the women based on age, location, and how often they were alone. Using a social worker's identification card, she would trick the women into letting her in by saying that she was from the government and informing them they were eligible for welfare programs. In March of 2008, she was sentenced to a whopping 759 years in prison. I often wonder, if I would have been doing the world a favor if I had hit her with my truck that night. Number 3 I hate the fact that I even have a story to share, but it goes to show you when living in a major metropolitan city, you never know what walks of life you'll pass by or drop off. So a little backstory. In 2003, I was a 16-year-old employee at an urban clothing store here on the south side of Chicago. At the time, I had a manager who was in his early 20s by the name of Anthony. Anthony was pretty arrogant and obnoxious, but overall he was a really cool guy. I used to kind of give him shit and tease him whenever it came to approaching the ladies, because he always seemed timid or too aggressive. I was, and still am, a ladies man. So yeah, I was being an asshole. After working at this place for about three months, Anthony asked me if I would drop him off at home. It wasn't far from the direction I was heading in. So I dropped him off maybe twice a week for the next month or so. Now let me tell you, these car rides were quite uncomfortable. This guy, as much as we spoke at work, would not speak and sort of just kept looking straight, barely ever blinking. It got to the point where his awkwardness went from being entertaining to straight up creepy. Fast forward three or four years later, I'm watching the news as they go into detail of a horrific crime committed by a Comcast installation worker. Apparently, the worker entered two homes for an installation. He sexually assaulted, beat, and strangled two women. The real unfortunate thing is that this happened on two different occasions. And after the first murder, the gentleman was arrested and questioned, but ended up being released and sent back out to work, which allowed him to strike again. As the picture of his mugshot flashed on the screen, I froze. It was Anthony. Now growing up on the south side of Chicago, I've grown up and befriended a fair share of people who ended up becoming murderers, but this takes the cake. Hey, what's up guys? Uncle Unit here. So I really don't know what's going to happen on this channel next week because for those of you who don't know, I live in Florida. Hurricane Irma is set to hit Florida straight up, so I'm kind of thinking that my apartment complex is going to lose power. By the time it reaches where I am, it's predicted to be a Category 3. So that's still a massive hurricane that's going to come through here. I really did think about evacuating, but that would just be way too much for me right now. Plus, all the uh, highways are just jammed, packed full of people trying to leave the state. 
And really, I was looking at the path of the hurricane, and it looks like southern Florida is going to get it the worst. I heard they evacuated the Florida Keys already, so that's good. And I live more in the northern area of Florida, so hopefully the storm doesn't do too much damage here. I'll be updating my audience on my situation on Twitter, so if you want to follow me there. I want to thank everyone for all their support, and hopefully we'll be back in business really soon. So yeah, you guys take care, and if you live in Florida, be sure to prepare yourself for the storm and be safe. Until next time, never forget. There's always a reason to be afraid.